The last time I, I came in, in Italy uh, to make a presentation to people who are mixing economy and, and math was in 98 at uh, La Sapienza. And at that time, uh, Peter Lawrence, who invited me, told me, Raphael, you should wear a tie so that uh, people won't uh, think of how you are uh, dressed uh, uh, and they will focus on your talk. But if you come in jeans, they will think, you know, why is he in jeans? And, so. and here I had a problem because, uh, uh, you know, I had to take a small plane from Paris. So I had just a, a small uh, suitcase, didn't have room to fit a tie in it. Uh, so <laughs> I came in jeans, so I had to think, you know, how to make people not focus on my jeans. So I, I wear shoes on two different colors. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so I hope that you will uh, focus on, on, the, on the content of the, of the talk, uh, which is uh, the other type of uh, crisis uh, that uh, Peter Kyle uh, was talking about. Uh, he was focusing on crashes, uh, possibly flash, uh, possibly uh, more damaging here. I am looking at precisely uh, the, uh, the global instabilities, especially those that we know today, uh, in regards of the European debt crisis. <clears throat> and we'll focus on what drives, basically, if you want to understand the danger of the European debt crisis, and it's more difficult because I think this type of crisis uh, is new in some sense, uh, especially uh, in a political context like Europe. And uh, so that's why uh, I try to explain. And basically, my driver will be to analyze in depth uh, what drives the demand uh, for sovereign bonds. <clears throat> so let's first what, see what we talk about. Uh, if you look at the combined Eurozone debt as a percentage of GDP, well, that's what it looks like. So it was in the 60s. I mean, I remember uh, it was ranging around 70%, whereas officially uh, the mass risk criteria is at 60%. Hmm? <clears throat> but it blew up close to 90%, and I think it's way, it's today, uh, uh, more like 90 to 100 percent. And uh, second uh, thing is, I think these are official estimates. If we were to put uh, the real uh, estimates of the debt, uh, and in particular, uh, there are a number of uh, tricks that states use to hide the debt and, and be closer to mass risk criteria, in particular, put some uh, debt into companies. Uh, I, I know how they do it in France. I know less how they do it in other countries. But they would put debt in companies that are granted by the state. And uh, so basically, I mean, it's uh, uh, the social security game. So it's a very complex game. The pension game is a very complex game where they use accounting rules, where they trick the accounting rules to make to to decrease basically the liability of the state. So. Uh, the true figure is probably way above that, but it is very characteristic that we saw in 2008 this huge uh, increase in the debt. One could think uh, that, uh, okay, suddenly uh, we have a big change in the economy and, and uh, the, it wasn't that way. I mean, the economy uh, went much smoother than that. So it's a typical balance between pockets. Mm -hmm. Money, uh, the debt was much more in the private sector, and then it went up to the, uh, the public sector. The bailout was made, and this is a consequence of bailout to prevent uh, bankruptcy of a lot of the private sector, in particular the financial sector. <clears throat> if you look by country, and you know you've been accusing everybody, well, look at how it goes. And uh, who has the biggest uh, change in inflections? Hmm? The, uh, you see uh, the, uh, where is it? Uh, the, the top ones are Italy and Germany. 
And uh, here, I'm counting here in absolute uh, euros, in billions of euros. It's not as a percentage of GDP. Mm -hmm. But look at the German debt. Uh, the Italian debt is growing without, without change in the trend. The German debt is approximately the same, and uh, then it spikes up. Uh, the dotted line is accumulated on the right scale, so there is a factor uh, five on the right scale. And uh, the, you see that the Ireland and Greece are uh, down and pretty low. And the other um, country that has a huge uh, change in, in the slope in 2008 is UK. And this is interesting, we are going to see uh, why so. <coughs> The first uh, observation in uh, the demand and the, what drives uh, the, 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 the demand for bonds and what uh, creates, uh, there is a structural instability in the, in the, in the, fi in the financial system, which has been uh, pointed out by Minsky. Minsky uh, divides the borrowers into three types of borrowers what he calls hedge borrowers, who have an income sufficient to uh, not only pay the interest on the debt, but also pay back piece of the capital. Normally, any normal savvy person should be so. <clears throat> then you have uh, the speculative borrowers who are at the limit where their income is just sufficient to cover the interest rates on the debt and basically this, they keep a level of uh, indebtedness which is uh, constant. And the Ponzi borrower, on the contrary, uh, borrow more in order to be able even to pay the debt burden, so the charge on the interest rates. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to do so, that means that the Ponzi borrower has to implicitly assume that his assets will be uh, sold at a higher price. You, you, you buy a house, you borrow 120% of the price of the house because you hope that at some point you'll be able to sell the house at a higher price. <clears throat> in a growth phase, what happens, and this is exactly Minsky observation, in a growth phase, what happens is that the uh, it allows Ponzi borrowers because precisely you assume this increase in the price of the, of the assets. Uh, because you have confidence that reduces the level of the rates and therefore people can be uh, what where Ponzi becomes uh, speculative because the, the level of debt is lower. And the, sorry, the level of the rates is lower, and therefore the, the, in, the, the, the interest that you have to pay on your debt are lower. Mm -hmm. uh, that, of course, because of that, increases the leverage because it makes it financially interesting to borrow more because you borrow at a lower rate, and you increase the leverage. And I want to point out here uh, this huge increase of the global leverage of the economy uh, between years, but basically the burst of the tech bubble in 2000 and the uh, financial crisis in 2007, 2008. Uh, what happened is that uh, through different mechanisms that we'll see, uh, the, the, it was very interesting to borrow and that would put a, a lot of companies in LBO, so leverage buyout uh, structures. <clears throat> in, a in a recession phase, then you get a sudden downturn, uh, the confidence in destroyed, the interest rates go up, and people who were speculative become Ponzi, and even some of the hedge pass the barrier and become Ponzi. Mm -hmm. So the, and then you enter into a, a, a deadly loop, uh, the credit spreads uh, increase because the confidence is uh, destroyed based on hard facts. Indeed, people become Ponzi, so they are not solvable, therefore the interest rate goes up, etc. And it ends into defaults. <coughs> Let's look at the other side. So this was basically, you know, from the borrower point of view, 
and uh, the, you know, okay, let's look at the lender point of view. So let's examine how come there is a demand for bonds. A demand for bonds is people who are willing to lend money. Well, in a normal lending process, uh, basically you have uh, an entrepreneur, a borrower, who proposes uh, different financial schemes to investors. Mm -hmm. uh, it can propose to invest as equity in some project, or it can propose to invest as a bond. As a bond or a loan, you get a fixed income, and the risk is that the project does not pay, and therefore it's a default risk. Otherwise, you are sure of uh, the level of your return on investment. In the equity, you have less much, uh, much less security on, the, um, on your uh, return on investment, but at the same time, if the investment is very profitable, you are part of it. Hmm? <clears throat> so the investors will choose, and it will be a typical uh, um, type of Hayek choice, you know, between uh, different types of investments. <clears throat> you may have a second reason why uh, you are willing to lend money to uh, someone. If you are already invested, and therefore that action to lend comes as a complement to an existing situation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, suppose that the uh, borrower is close to default, but you estimate that this is a liquidity crisis and not a solvency crisis, that this project is a good project, but it's just going through a bad period, and you need to put more money in it. Again, in that case, it can be per se not a, a, a good idea to invest, but as a complement to an existing investment, just to save a situation, so to save another part of your investment, you, as an as a, as a incremental action, you may be interested in putting money in something which, <clears throat> in, a, in a trade, uh, that would be uninteresting if it were by itself. Uh, all of that is very important because we'll see, you know, that is what drives basically uh, the, 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 the market for uh, European bonds. The third aspect is what I call hiring a safe. And this is treasury management. Uh, somehow, if I give you a hundred dollars, okay, or euros, you just go say, well, that's nice, I go to the restaurant, and, uh, or I go to see a movie, or buy a pair of shoes, and, uh, the, uh, and I, you know, I can use it. If I give you a million, you can say, well, I buy a nice house. If I give you 10 million, you can profit of it, but, you know, that's up to a certain point. There is a point beyond which you cannot directly profit from your money. If I give you a billion, then you have no choice but investing it. Even putting your money as cash in a bank is a kind of investment. You are at risk. In fact, what you have instead, you don't owe a billion. What you owe is uh, engagement of getting uh, profits from that money in the future. Yourself, your uh, uh, your your uh, children or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you have no choice but investing. So cash is a kind of investment. A bond is another kind of investment, and etc. Now, why uh, do you need uh, to do so? Uh, there is different possible reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, you may have regulatory obligations uh, to uh, put money. Uh, you may want to build a cushion uh, because, or to put that money as collateral for other trades. And <clears throat> there are plenty of reasons why you want to uh, detain a given piece of paper and what is written on the paper, who has, uh, what is basically the legal statute of that paper. <clears throat> uh, so, 
the uh, so you, we have to keep that in mind uh, as you know in terms of uh, why lending money basically is a usual uh, activity I expect return on my investment the second is I am protecting other investment and the third one is I have no choice it's just you know the less worth of all the possible investments hmm? <coughs> Now, why interest rates are unstable? That is typically a Minsky, uh, uh, Minsky uh, observation. Mm -hmm. And let me look at it from a government perspective. So just transpose the uh, Minsky uh, three types of borrowers uh, in the context of a government. Mm -hmm. <coughs> The first is, so let's uh, just uh, use uh, the uh, capital letters are absolute value and small letters as are in relation as a percentage of the GDP. So capital D is a debt, little d is a debt as a percentage of GDP. N is uh, the government net income, so taxes, etc., less uh, all the civil servants, uh, but uh, as uh, except the debt burden. So I don't count here the debt burden. And R is interest rate. In here I made it simple. There's just one rate at which the, borrow, the government has to borrow. So it's the, what the, the, the service of the debt. Mm -hmm. And what is the dynamics? Well, the GDP grows at a growth factor little g. The, interest, the debt grows by the interest rate but you can refund a piece of it by capital N. And uh, the, if you made a small calculation, uh, then you find out uh, that uh, you have a dynamic on the debt, uh, which is given by uh, this uh, simple equation, just you know, uh, writing uh, those uh, simple uh, rules. <coughs> You see that I put a little, an index saying the J is the index, is the time index. So it's time period, whatever period you can use in here. Uh, the, uh, but we, as I say, you see the growth uh, is uh, time dependent, the net income of the government is time dependent, and the interest rates is time dependent as well. Uh, the reason that if when you are going to try to optimize uh, these dynamics, you are in the position of the government and trying to def determine your policy, uh, you see that N will depend, I mean, the higher you tax, the better, supposedly, you get uh, 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 possibilities to refund your debt. But what the, what the consequence of increasing the value of N is the fact that you destroy the growth. Mm -hmm. uh, other things uh, also, uh, if you uh, try to, to, to cut the, and, uh, to, to, to <coughs> cut expenses, same thing, you have an impact on the growth. On the contrary, uh, the interest rates is basically determined by the market, so the interest rate will be higher or lower depending on uh, how the market perceives whether you are solvable or not. And solvable, not uh, a matter of liquidity. So what we have is, uh, first of all, in this very simple dynamics, uh, a critical debt level. Uh, assume that uh, the growth, as we typically have now, is below the interest rate. Uh, then uh, what we see is this type of dynamics where you have a critical level of debt. Uh, if the debt is higher, we don't have enough growth to uh, maintain, uh, the, to reimburse the debt. On the contrary, if the interest rate is lower, uh, then we have enough growth to uh, reimburse the debt. <coughs> if I now uh, look at the uh, interest rates, fixed by the market as a consequence of uh, the level of debt. So here, we assume that the impact on the debt uh, at the borrowing rate uh, is now, uh, basically you try to say, uh, I, I would like to uh, be reimbursed uh, 
up to the default probability of the state. So pi is a probability that I will get in default. And in that case, I should apply an interest rate R, which is proportional to pi over 1 minus pi, in order simply to be rewarded to the risk for the risk of not being refunded. There is a risk premium, so uh, the interest rate is in fact 1 plus k times uh, this probability, and I define that as a certain function, which is an estimate that the market does, you know, rule of thumb, of uh, how, uh, what is the likely, no, likelihood that the, 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 um, that the, the state will default. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and then once you do that, then you have a two-dimensional dynamics. Mm -hmm. The two variables now become D and R because D evolves according to the relation that we saw on the previous uh, slide, but R now evolves also as a function of D. If D increases, then you get impacted. On the contrary, if D decreases, you get a better rate from the market. That's complicated. That's why I left it as a function F because it depends on a lot of things. And, um, <clears throat> Whether uh, you are stable or not will depend on uh, the uh, Jacobian matrix of this dynamical system. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, there is, a, now the critical point becomes uh, both in D and R, and there is a, a critical uh, level of rate. Uh, if the rate is above that level, basically, we are in the unstable uh, situation, the current is the rate is below, uh, we have rates going down because there is, uh, the market is more and more confident. And uh, the, so we, we can compute this Jacobian uh, happens if you look at it, and if F is normal, and we'll see that it's not so obvious, the, the, the uh, DF over DD is not obviously positive. It's not obvious that the higher the depth, the uh, higher the interest rate. Uh, but assume that this is the case. In that case, all the entries of the Jacobian matrix are positive. And we know that in that case, if the, all the entries of the Jacobian matrix are positive, the, the fixed uh, point uh, will tend to be, uh, will, uh, will be, um, uh, I mean, you have a positive trace. So at least one of the eigenvalues is positive, And so it can only be unstable. And I want to, I want to show you uh, the dynamics that that it creates. So I took a, a formula for F, uh, which is uh, here uh, basically the new rate is a previous rate plus something that depends on the difference between the capacity to reimburse the debt and the level of the debt. Mm -hmm. So uh, I get this typical hyperbolic behavior. So you see the two, the, the instable uh, uh, equilibrium. Uh, if you are below, then you tend to, uh, uh, you, if you are above that separatrix here, if you are above this, this uh, stable manifold of the, this is, if this goes like this, then this goes like this. And if you start from above, you see that you derive to default, even in that case, and if you start from below that line, then on the contrary, the depth tends to decrease. Of course, this is a pure mathematical stuff, and it's, the reality is not exactly like this. But uh, that shows you, you know, the base uh, configuration of these dynamics between the rate and the depth. <coughs> so, how many countries do you think are in Ponzi today? Well, let's see a picture of Europe. And I made two different colors. Uh, the blues uh, correspond to a Eurozone, and the yellow correspond to a non-Euro. And you see that the blues are along a line where uh, you do have this relation between depth and level of interest rates. And that matches the dynamics I was showing you. Hmm? That basically, uh, this was made actually uh, in, in March, Spain was here, and today Spain is uh, beyond Ireland. So it, you see that it drifts along that line here. Greece is over there, and it's probably even uh, further. I'm not sure if Italy came back, 
uh, Ireland definitely came back, Portugal probably went up. And you see that, you know, how the Germany is a bit off because, in fact, it's that it's huge respect to, but the, 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 the German debt today is even higher than the rates. You see, so you have this move of Germany and France away from that curve. Whereas, on the contrary, Spain went exactly on the curve. Uh, now, the interesting thing about the yellows is that they're completely off the curve. Look at UK, uh, it's more like Germany and France. Sweden, Poland, there is no reason why, uh, what is this one? Uh, probably Norway, something like this. Uh, no, Norway is, is, is here. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the, the, the side of the bubble represents the side of the debt. And uh, you see that there is no reason why Poland would be, and Hungary would be penalized. It's purely, uh, uh, this is purely, um, yes? Just a clarification, if you say that things above drift up along the curve, things below the dashed line, well, the, the left, or? No, no, they, no, you have moves of, along the curve because the, the, the fact that the, the, the monetary policy is frozen by the euro makes the, the dynamics of rates and debt basically move along that curve. Some countries, when they go down, they will go down along the curve, and when you go up, they will go up along that curve. But you have this, basically, this link between the level of debt and the level of rates. And uh, uh, it's empirical that you, you really see that they move, even when you follow month to month, you know, the level of rates and the level of debt, you see it moving along that curve, globally speaking. Well, what is that curve? What is the dash line? It, it, it's an empirical curve that I just, you know, estimated from the data. But when I... Uh, 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 from how it's not far from that kind of curve. Should be that kind of curve, which is it. That's exactly, so that's exactly the point about the, the difference between uh, yellow and blue. Hmm? Well, maybe some of the, I don't know in which currency Poland borrows. Uh, it Poland it it borrows in Zlotis, and it has a hard time borrowing in Zlotis. So there is a confidence effect. People are confident in the British pound. They are not confident in the Zloty. Yeah. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. You see that my dynamics assume you cannot create money. Yeah, exactly. 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 And that's what we are going to talk about. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the point where I pre Exactly. No, no, absolutely. In theory, there is no reason why they would not be able to borrow, but this is, that's a whole story. That's also, okay. Uh, when you see these dynamics, the consequence is that when you are doing, you know, computing value at risk and things like this, that the distribution of interest rate is not, is not a, is not a, a single uh, uh, mode uh, with only one bump. It's multimodal, and the reason it's a really typical where uh, you have, you know, the, the, you have this picture where you see the guy on the lake, and the lake is very calm, but you have a big chute, uh, uh, waterfall, you know, uh, and then uh, there is a, a point beyond which the guy, you know, is, a, is on a small bark and he can uh, he can row, but he has a limit speed, and the 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 the, the stream towards the cascade is uh, goes at an increasing speed. And there is a point beyond which the speed is too high so that the guy cannot escape. It's exactly the phenomenon of this uh, light horizon in black holes, where there is a limit beyond which the light cannot escape from the black hole. And uh, <coughs> the, uh, so in here we're in the same situation where uh, there is some fluctuations, but there is a limit beyond which uh, you cannot by whatever means you cannot, you, you don't row fast enough to escape this attractor that makes you in default. And so uh, the distribution should be more uh, multimodal where you have a normal mode and a crisis mode. If you're asking me today 
Uh, Italy is more mixed and it's more complicated, probably because it's closer to the cascade. France is away. The, the, the interest rate at which France borrowed today is very low. Uh, although the risk of having a Spanish story in France is not 100%, hopefully, but it is a real risk. If you're asking me for 99% value at risk, I will certainly put a Spanish scenario within this 99%. Mm -hmm. uh, so why market by sovereign debt? The first thing, no choice, it's a safe. Mm -hmm. So that's that point. Mm -hmm. And this is very different from investment, mm -hmm. to, especially today. Regulatory pressure, cost of capital, uh, it is capital. Liquidity, it is a flight to quality. You know that if you own some uh, paper signed by a major government, major government, and that's where you go into Zloty, it's not the same thing. Zloty is more like, uh, debt in Zloty would be more like a, a corporate debt. Um, uh, sorry. <coughs> So, and this is the true reason. Hmm? Market are agitated, therefore, I buy, because of the US debt, market are agitated, and because of that, I buy T-bonds. Hmm? So, this is a typical flight to quality phenomenon. Hmm? So, the question is, uh, this is uh, uh, fed by the regulations, by the, 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 the cook ratio, is driving money towards uh, the government debt. Mm -hmm. So, uh, question now, uh, we'll have this game between central bank, governments, and the financial sector. Mm -hmm. What is interest rates risk? I mean, like any uh, matter of supply and demand, let me go a bit fast because otherwise uh, I will not be able to uh, finish. Um, <clears throat> so flight to quality. And in here, I want to point out what happened, uh, you know, the difference between T-bonds and AAA bonds. In principle, AAA bonds are almost as sure as T-bonds. There is no real difference in terms of default risk. So look at the, uh, uh, the, the you, these are two funds, uh, I think Vanguard funds, uh, one in 20 years T-bonds and one in 20 years uh, uh, AAA bond mostly, a big little mix with AA, but basically it was AAA bonds, mm -hmm. uh, corporate bonds. So uh, you see that uh, by the time of the, this is, by the time of the financial crisis, uh, when the stock market fell, the AAA bond fell as well. Whereas the, uh, and this is when it started back, uh, in, uh, that started in January actually for the bonds. Uh, so this was fall of 2008 and this started in January. And uh, the, the, you see that there was no decrease in uh, the T-bonds. So uh, you only had the, the, the increase. On the contrary, you had a true decrease uh, in the price of AAA bonds. Mm -hmm. So just to show you that thing that on paper have the exact same risk, uh, behave very differently at the time of the crisis. Mm -hmm. So the demand for T-bonds remains sustained because it is cash. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, then uh, this is, uh, um, so vanishing demand it can be irrational and I really want to compare uh, the two mirror effects, which are uh, a vanishing demand as well as uh, a vanishing supply or an over demand uh, creating a speculative bubble. Mm -hmm. uh, this one I was found, uh, found it in, uh, in one on the internet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are like tables, plenty of demand and plenty of supply. <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, this is a mechanism that you, you all know, you know, you, had, you get the price by supply and demand, and then uh, you have a sudden uh, change in the asset liquidity, the supply increases, at the same time the demand decreases, and you see that the impact on the price is huge. Hmm? Uh, okay, so I'll go fast. Now, talking about this 
uh, uh, infernal uh, uh, loops I took, you know, the, on the contrary, you know, the, the, the gods that are supposed to supply us with money. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Uh, then you see that you have uh, three entities, which is the financial sector, the state, and the central bank. You have to know that by the time of uh, the, uh, Venetian, uh, the Venetian time, you know, those described by Shakespeare in The Merchant of Venice, uh, which was the start of this big um, uh, supply and demand, we had only two entities. We had the governments, the kingdoms actually, and we had the financial sector, those merchants, who were lending money to the kingdoms. And uh, the, uh, there was no uh, central bank at that time. There was papers that what we have banknotes today who are signed by central bank, they were uh, how do you say asinia in English? Uh, the you know the, the, the those papers signed by the by the by the king uh, or by the treasurer of the king. Uh, so basically, they were granted by the state. Uh, they were used to finance wars and things like this. Uh, Louis XIV was uh, a big consumer of such uh, things and uh, granted by nothing. <coughs> Today we have just the same story with three entities. And I want to really put that in the same level. There is no so much difference between a banknote signed by a central bank and a T-bond signed by a state. And this is the reason why you have this flight to quality. In some sense, I would like you to look at the debt, not as a debt, but as a monetary mass. And that is a consequence of the regulation. And who has the power of putting regulations? Precisely a state. A state has the power of doing regulations, uh, uh, raising taxes, etc. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was this comment made in the paper by uh, Asharia and uh, uh, his uh, co-authors uh, at NYU uh, Stern. Uh, precisely, you know, saying the link that you have between those three uh, entities and the fact that they bail out each other. Mm -hmm. And I want here, uh, as you will, uh, we won't spend time here, but I want to, you to read this excerpt of Master and Margarita, uh, written by Bulgakov in the 30s, uh, which is extraordinary because it describes uh, how uh, this character he has, the master who is uh, Voland, uh, is uh, creating in a magic show, uh, he's creating money. And this is this extraordinary comment at the end, where he says there, there is, he, so he has disappeared, and Fagot is his uh, damn soul, you know, who follows him all the place. And there's someone, you have to tell us what's the trick, what's the trick. And Fagot says, there is no trick, it's all quite plain. So this story of money creation is all quite plain. And if you look at it, it's so accurate with today's situation. Basically, as soon as uh, assets are valued by mark to market, you it's not, there is nobody creating money. The market is creating money by simply deciding that confidence is coming. The market is destroying money by simply saying the confidence is appearing. So you have this game where uh, you have money creation and money destruction by simply, you know, market estimates. Mm -hmm. uh, just to show you evidence, this is in France, uh, to show you the blue is the, the CDS of the French state, and the green and the others on the top are all uh, um, uh, financial sector uh, CDSs. You have Credit Agricole in green, Red is Société Générale, and the brown one is AXA, so an insurance company. You see that they follow completely the state uh, risk. Yeah. Whereas if you take LVMH, you get uh, something which is totally uncorrelated. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, I did it paid as well. <clears throat> okay, so I go fast, and uh, same thing, you know, the, just to show that the, the driver, the regulation is something that is 
meant in the logic of confidence, and therefore the regulation is increasing the Minsky high instability. It just made to increase Minsky instability, and I'm pretty feared about that. Hmm? <clears throat> Uh, we are talking about currencies, so uh, there is plenty of people saying uh, we should get out of euro. I made a little, uh, I'm completely, uh, I don't know what's the word, you know, panicked over it, by uh, those economists who suggest we should get out of euro in the current context, uh, where we have huge debt. I mean, if they want to put, uh, to, to, to destroy the economic machine, if they want to have an Argentinian or a Greek type of story, uh, that's an efficient way. So let's see uh, the, the consequences. If Euro disappears uh, after a default of one or one major country, you know, Spain, Italy, can be France as well, hmm? <clears throat> then we get this deadly debt spiral and in the possibility to find a political agreement to bail out uh, the, the, the country. Mm -hmm. And the European countries decide to abandon the common currency. So you could say, okay, well, some will get out, some will have a, some period of trouble period. Well, let's see the consequence. Uh, basically, the, the existing debt of the defaulting country can be managed in two ways. Uh, the, Existing debt is converted into a basket. Uh, so I was owing, uh, I mean, I'm France, I owe a certain number of euros. Then suddenly investors have a paper saying France is supposed to give me euros. Now, if euro disappears, then what's the consequence? I could say logically, I will ask France to give me a basket of all the European currencies. Hmm? Piece of franc France, piece of Deutschmark, piece of Italian lira, etc. Uh, or the country can do what Argentina did when it decided to unpeg the peso to dollar. To say, okay, I owed you, some of them I was owing you dollars, some of them I was owing you peso, but suddenly everything is in peso and I won't guarantee the exchange rate between peso and dollar and so suddenly it's like a default. Mm -hmm. So if France decides that the debt will be only French francs, it's exactly the Argentinian story and it's a default. What's the consequence? Mm -hmm. The weak currencies, which I call the Mediterranean, hmm, is deserted, deserted for strong currencies. So everybody will sell Mediterranean, Mediterranean currencies and buy Northern Europe currencies. And in here, there is an interesting point. Remember I was telling you this function F of R and D, you know, interest rate as a function of the debt. And I say, okay, it's, it's unrelated. You see that the image, the marketing, is very strong. The fact that all the financial uh, press is in English, owned by Anglo-Saxon countries, is something that protects somehow Northern Europe from desertion from markets. On the contrary, globally speaking, Mediterranean countries tend to have bad press, and so if something happens, oh, they are not, these are not reliable people, they are cheating on the accounts, etc. We'll point out all the uh, black market, etc. that appears in those countries. <coughs> um, the Mediterranean bond prices will immediately drop on the second market, hmm? Uh, on secondary market, and as a consequence, the primary market is also locked uh, uh, as borrowing yields will explode. Hmm? So immediately, the access to borrowing by Mediterranean countries will be dramatically reduced. That will create huge inflation, etc. So on that side, it's resolved through an inflation, an inflationary uh, story. But at the same time, you will have a flight to quality and it's, a, it's not in, in a matter of year once we see the inflation, so it's a matter of weeks to see a ratio between, for instance, Deutschmark and Italian Lira. I said double, it may go to a factor 10 or something like this. It can be huge and extremely fast. What's the consequence? Very bad for the northern economies because too strong a currency makes price go up and this is exactly the classical mechanism. And therefore, uh, there, uh, here, at a matter of three to five years, 
the Germans uh, will have a very poor economy. They will have recession and so forth because of too strong currency, the typical Japanese story. And the consequence, because Europe is a major actor in the global economy, well, you'll see a global recession as a consequence of that. So I see it as a real, real uh, uh, crazy, I mean, uh, crazy type of suggestion. Hmm? <clears throat> Here, let me present a possible solution to the European crisis, which uh, first try to understand where it comes from. You want to protect the demand. There is basically only one way to protect the demand, is if you consider that uh, sovereign debt is a paper that is bought like a currency, uh, then you want it to be a strong currency. The only way to be a strong currency, we did the euro to be a strong currency, that was a paper signed by central banks. We have no choice of doing the same thing for things signed by the state. So that means mutualizing the debt. Now, uh, the good thing that, uh, why that does that protect? Because if you think of the investment process, who are the investors, large pension funds and so forth? They must diversify their portfolio. So, you know, they will decide that okay, we have to put a certain amount in stocks, a certain amount in bonds, and some amount in other assets, and within the bonds, a certain, a certain amount in sovereign bonds, a certain amount in corporate bonds. And these are, you know, percentage. And on top of that, the more risky, the more you will have on bonds, and the more within the bonds you will have on sovereign bonds. This is exactly this bear that I was showing, market at Chopi, therefore I invest in T-bonds. <coughs> If you leave, I mean, there, there is one rule in market. Either you do with that rule, or you are slave of the market. If you try to tell the market, forgive my uh, French, go fuck off, <laughs> uh, you will be the slave of the market. If you don't want to be a slave of the market, you have to deal with the only single rule of the market, supply and demand. You have to protect the demand. If you want to protect the demand, if you go to the market with different countries, with different signatures, the market will always go fly to quality. So it will go to Germany and it will desert Italy. Uh, the on only way is to say, okay, you have no choice. There is only one type of paper. You apply on supply. Supply is only one signature. It's Europe. You buy it, you don't buy it. If you have rules saying you have to invest a certain amount of money, then that money, uh, you are not in the logic of saying invest in here because you'll get nice rates. You say invest in here because anyway, your rule impose that you invest in some bonds and the only bonds that are available are euro bonds. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is the most efficient way to protect the demand for those bonds. So in that case, Generally speaking, there is for uh, a, um, a, uh, an economic entity like Europe, no risk of uh, explosion of interest rates, unlike a lot of people say. No more, you no more risk than you have also explosion on the interest rate in the US. <clears throat> now, the question is here, how do you make euro bonds acceptable to Germans and compatible with the existing treaty? Then you have two reasons. You have, uh, the Germans will say, okay, we don't want to pay for the Greeks. No problem. The day where a taxpayer pays something is when the economy is such that it has to pay more. Uh, so if you have an increase in the interest rates, that day the taxpayer pays. If you are decreasing the interest rate, on the contrary, the taxpayer is benefiting. So as long as you maintain the level of borrowing rates of Germany, uh, you don't ask any penny to the Germans. Uh, so uh, now you just put a rule saying, okay, there is a spread, Europe is borrowing at a certain rate, uh, the, uh, then from that rate, countries who are savvy, who have good ratios, will borrow at that rate minus the spread. On the contrary, countries who have bad ratios will borrow at that level of rate 
plus a spread. But the difference with the current situation, that this is controlled by a formula. So may, let's say Europe borrows at 2% or 3%. And that spread will range from 1% to 3 or 4 or 5% at most. It will never go to crazy numbers like we see in Spain or even in Italy today with 7, etc. So uh, basically, you, are, you prevent these dynamics because you say the, you, have, you, you have killed the dynamics. You just say, okay, Europe borrows. That level of rate is controlled by uh, the by the by the by the fact that it's a major by the protection of on demand by that logic because you have analyzed the demand and there is a spread which is frozen by your formula it cannot go crazy. <clears throat> the other aspect is uh, the uh, European treaties uh, which force to collateralize uh, those bonds which is not so difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this is just what the mechanism was explaining, and the fact that basically uh, grasshoppers will remain grasshoppers, but uh, they uh, don't um, uh, they, they, they still borrow at sustainable rates, higher than the ants, but still sustainable rates. Thank you, and this is uh, the last. Uh, conclusion and uh, which is you know the last strophe of this uh, the grasshopper and the ants uh, uh, La Fontaine and just you know uh, you know the ants say okay well poor grasshopper let's ignore it except that they have no more work if there is no grasshopper <laughs> Yes. Very interested in your whole talk, but at the end, when you propose a central price price fixing mechanism, usually you play you pay some kind of penalty for price fixing. I mean, if you if you fix rents in the city, for example, then you have problems that uh, you know once you fix the rents, then uh, apartments are not um, people people have a hard time getting apartments because they become so precious. No, no, he, no, 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 no I, 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 I'm out of that type of logic because precisely uh, you put, it's like you put a barrier, it's, it's okay, you, you will still have a secondary market, but it will be globally a, a secondary market, it's like you mutualize things. So uh, uh, in the case of France, you still have uh, private people who own apartments and private people who rent, and then you have a supply and demand between private people, you have a market here. Uh, you have another market, which is a market for mortgage-backed securities. You have investors who say, okay, I want to invest in the real estate market, and I get uh, 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 interest from that by the level of the rent. So in here, it's like, you know, you say, I, want, I, 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 I do mortgage-backed securities, but uh, globally at a, at a totally mutualized level, uh, so that from the investor's point of view, uh, you only have a relation to uh, European Treasury that would manage all those bonds. Now, uh, how the European Treasuries lends money to the particular states would be ruled by internal European rules. Mm -hmm. uh, you can still have states borrowing. I mean, in the US, you have federal bonds. And you have also uh, state bonds and uni bonds, and you, you do have those. You have a market for those. But uh, the, the, what really drives the market is uh, that of uh, the, the, the federal uh, the, the, the T-bonds. Mm -hmm. So as, as I look at Europe right now, one of the uh, major problems is that, that Greece's is, is, uh, real exchange rate is just too high. The country's not competitive. Spain's is too high. It's not competitive. The, 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 is too high. It's not competitive. Sorry. And okay. your mechanism doesn't reduce the real exchange rate, so I don't see how it solves the problem of making Greece first, and then Spain, then Italy uh, competitive. Okay. There, there is a huge difference uh, between Greece and Spain, half of it, although it's already deep, and Italy or France. Uh, 
Greece is a collateral damage. The, 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 the economic machine in Greece is broken. It's totally broken. Mm -hmm. People don't pay taxes because if you're a civil servant and you, the, the state is supposed to give you money and you don't receive that money, there is no reason why you will pay taxes on money that you haven't received. I mean, they, they, the, 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 so the, 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 the global economic machine, the confidence within the country is totally broken. It's half broken in Spain, it's close to be broken. That it was broken in Argentina, it took 10 years to re-establish some type of economic machine. I saw Russia in the 90s, the economic machine was broken. You know, when you have a country where the economic machine is broken, uh, it takes a very long time to recreate it to recreate people who are ready to open a company, hire people. What is a hire? It's an investment. And uh, so I think it's too late. Uh, the thing that, my opinion in Greece, you know, in France we have Corsica, it's about the same thing. Uh, uh, Corsica, you know, Greece for Europe. Uh, Corsica, uh, Greece is, is potentially a country that can make money, they are workers. I mean, uh, anybody, uh, a large part of Greece is, is the tourism. Uh, 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 anybody who has worked in a restaurant or hotel knows that working in a restaurant or hotel is an enormous work. So Greece, are, unlike what Germans say, they're big workers. But uh, there is a lot of black economy, and so that was not going through. Uh, but the economic machine today in Greece is totally broken. So it's not a matter here, now Greece, the only way to, to get Greece out is to re-establish an economic machine. That will take time. And, uh, Do you compare with Argentina? In Argentina's case, the main mechanism for re-establishing was currency valuation, and that uh, changed the picture. So yeah, yeah, no, but the, the, no, no, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one, uh, that's, that's what I say. If, what I was saying about destruction of euro, if you, if, you, if you break the euro, that means that you go through a path where you first destroy the economic machine and you recreate it through an inflation mechanism. That's a very, very damaging way. The question is, do we want to do so? I mean, do you want to break a machine that works to go through that and then get back? I mean, in the meantime, you have half of the, half of the population is unemployed. I mean, you have to understand what the uh, social consequences of what, what we are talking about. Hmm? If you leave, let's take Spain on the euro, and everything in Spain, uh, roughly speaking, is 20% 20 20 more expensive than things in Germany, then Spain will, ne will not be able to compete with the Germans. Uh, and it, it, Spain will be broken because it's not competitive. If they had their own currency and it, and it depreciated. The question is whether Spain went already too far to, 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 to maintain. Oh, Italy has a, an economic machine that works. But, you know, if you, break, if you break the euro, Italy now will be a damage. France also will be a damage. And both of countries have economic machines that work. But the countries that you've been using as your examples and all of the experience that we have shows that if countries massively devalue, their export sector has a chance to recover. I, I admit that in the case of Greece, that's mostly tourism that's kind of the effective export sector. But in the case of France and Italy, there are a lot of manufactured products that they could potentially export a lot more of if they were 20 or 30 or 40 percent cheaper, which is what would happen if they had their own currency. It's more than that. Well, the case of France, I know it a bit well. Uh, I'm not sure about Italy. Italy is much more industrial than France from that point of view. Uh, France is a country which has much more civil servants than Italy. Uh, if France wants to develop, it's not by, by decreasing the, the, the price of goods by 20%. We'll never compete with China. It's by creating more innovative goods, more goods that have high value, and that are recognized high value, and that we have a chance to get out. Exactly what Germans do. <clears throat> Um, we want to be short, it's late. Uh, I have many points um, of concern with your suggestion. Two very brief remarks and I uh, welcome your feedback. One is that you, do this, you don't discuss the fact that any you know, depth logic or investment on stock market on, on any, any of the support has to be matched in the, in the long term by or sustainable uh, dimension by gain of productivity. 
and that's uh, the main driving force. I mean, if it's that, I mean, okay, there's that, no, there's no. I mean, it's not sustainable to have return on the market portfolio if it's not matched by growth of GDP. Uh, okay, that, that's, that's exactly the that's uh, that's the point I want to and, depart and this from. Is, and this is not okay. And second point <laughs> is that you were mentioning Japan as the example that uh, Germany would fall into. I mean, this is a fundamental misconception. Okay, Japan is a great success. It has grown. It has gone through. A, the biggest bubble, real estate and financial bubble of the whole world mm -hmm. at the peak of 1990, 45% of the stock market value was in Japan. The world market value was the Nikkei. Enormous, the value mm -hmm. of the imperial uh, domain, three kilo, uh, square kilometer was twice almost the value of the whole California. Nevertheless, the so-called two lost decades have seen their GDP plateaued, notwithstanding a decrease of workforce, aging, and so on. Mm -hmm. It's an extraordinary success. The Japanese scenario is the best possible outcome of the mess we are no, in. No, no, okay. The well, of, uh, I mean, uh, the, that, that, that I buy, uh, that I buy, and, and I, okay, I just, okay. American who travel to Japan. Mm -hmm. I mean, though, I mean, no, 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 that, that, and this one, this one I buy, and, I, I, and okay, but, okay, let me comment success. on the two. Okay, let me comment on the two. problem. Shall I take Matteo's question and I answer to all of them? Matteo, you know your question, so maybe you want me to answer. Because I want to answer uh, uh, oh, uh, DDS questions. Yeah. I don't have a question. I have a possible uh, answer for, for what uh, uh, Peter was saying. That uh, so, so I haven't thought this through. I just started it now. But uh, it, it looks like uh, Raphael's mechanism uh, corresponds to a monetization of the debt. At, exactly. different, at different rates for the different countries. And then uh, if the countries are prepared to uh, match with policy rates that will be then lower in Germany and higher uh, in the periphery, the, the end result is higher inflation in Germany and low inflation in the periphery, which would then uh, 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 solve your competitive problem. No, no. Well, although, although it will be very, 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 yeah, although it will be very, yeah. No, no, but they, they want, they, it's unlikely, I mean, that, that's why, okay, for, first of all, yeah, about the fact that the debt needs to be reimbursed. Uh, the truth is that the debt doesn't need to be reimbursed. You need to stay in the speculative. You, you cannot go into the Ponzi. Mm -hmm. But, so it's a mechanic, it's a dynamics between the rates and the, the and the level of debt, and if you look the the difference, you know uh, why when you have a, 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 a banknote, a banknote is a sheet of paper that has no interest rate, basically has interest rate equal zero. It's just simply liquid. You can hold it, and then when you need to spend it, you will find somebody to take it against a good. So, uh, uh, basically, you don't have any problem. The only issue that you have with banknotes is the management of the monetary mass. If you have too high a monetary mass, then you get inflation. So that's why you cannot create banknotes all the time. And that's the exact same limitation you have on increasing the debt of the states. Mm -hmm. In fact, you should manage the debt of the state like you manage a monetary mass, not like you manage a debt. Uh, because you do have interest rate, the interest rate will eventually uh, go to zero. And then, uh, indeed, you may have some inflation, uh, exactly like Mateus uh, says. Uh, if uh, you have some growth in some countries, mechanically you will have inflation, because you will have the, uh, and if you have no growth on, in other countries, uh, they will have to pay higher rates, and therefore, uh, uh, basically, you will have, uh, uh, you, you will have, uh, um, you have a pressure on inflation, and inflation will stay lower. Uh, now, according to your comparison, uh, your t uh, comment about Japan, it's a deeper comment. It's a nature of capitalism. Uh, if you analyze all of capitalism through the value of the stocks and the market value of the stocks, indeed, you need to have a growth in the value of the stocks to tell, okay, I created wealth. In the case of Japan, you don't have growth, in, but you get an economic machine that works amazingly well. People live well, there is no war, there is etc. And the people hire and there is employment. And as you say, you know, the population is getting older and older and there are still people to take care of the elder people. So globally, you get an economic machine. That's why 
like to talk about economic machine. And the same thing will happen in Germany. I mean, remember, in Germany, we have an, they have another problem. They have lots of poverty. I mean, the, 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 the inequalities of Gini uh, coefficient went up a lot. And they have uh, globally a big growth, but they also have an increase in inequalities. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, that's the problem. I mean, you will have probably, uh, in that situation, a, re a global decrease in the economic activity, but yet a sustained economic activity, which is also related to the character of the Germans, from that point of view, closer to the, to the Japanese, because they are big, you know, kind of entrepreneur all the time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but uh, I agree, I mean, the, 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 the fact that absolutely looking at the success of an economy through the value of the stocks is not necessarily the, the, the right thermometer. Mm -hmm. later now at the dinner. Actually, I want to uh, acknowledge, I didn't do it before, and I want to apologize, the fact that this workshop is uh, also the first workshop which is organized by the uh, laboratory of uh, financial, quantitative finance, which has been created uh, by the Spolano Valley, and which is also supported by LIST, and uh, LIST uh, is a company uh, whose headquarters are in Pisa and uh, who, by the way, invites the speakers tonight for dinner, so we are you? <laughs> quadratically. And um, so I think we can continue the conversation at dinner, and certainly we can continue the conversation all together and uh, broaden the, the, the topics tomorrow with all the other speakers, and thanks a lot. And uh, we invite uh, you all to be here tomorrow at 9. Okay, thank you.